If you've ever needed to prove you have remote access to a computer, we'll show you some flashy SSH hacks which will definitely let a user know you have remote access on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. When we're usually talking about SSH access to a computer, we're talking about backdoor access that the user has virtually no way of knowing what's going on, and that's an advantage for a hacker looking to do a bunch of bad things clandestinely. Now there might be some circumstances where we actually want the user to know that we have backdoor access, and that could be like a penetration tester who needs to let the client know, and that client might not be very tech savvy, that they actually have gotten access to this box and they need to fix something. Now, a client might not understand the implications of just encrypting a single file or doing something that's not that malicious. So instead, we can stay away from doing anything super malicious and instead use our access to play a couple pranks that might make someone who doesn't know a lot about computers think that their computer is actually haunted. Now, in order to do this, we'll simply have to have another computer on the network that we know the credentials to and that has an SSH server running. And we can do that with a DuckyScript payload or maybe with some malware that has that as the end stage. Now, we also need to be on the same network, and this is important because if we're going to be doing this over the internet, we would need to do some port forwarding on our router or something like that. So for now, we're just going to cover doing this on the same network as the device you want to access remotely. Now, also make sure you have permission to do this because if you do it against someone who doesn't know what's going on, they're probably going to think this is much more serious than it really is, and you could get in a lot of trouble doing this against someone who doesn't want you on their box running a bunch of remote commands. Now, if you get confused while you're doing this, you can also check out the Nullbyte article linked in the description, because it'll probably help you if you get snagged. Once you have a computer on the same network with a SSH server ready to go, and this is a Unix computer, so it can be Mac OS or Linux, then we're ready to begin. Now today our goal is a little bit different than usual, where we would be trying to be stealthy and go undetected. Instead, we want to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that we have remote access to this computer to someone who might not be very tech savvy or otherwise just do a bunch of spooky remote stuff to a computer that we have SSH access to. Now, first step obviously is going to be to log into this computer. So in this case, I have remote access to a computer at 192.168.0.16. So I'll log in with the really secure password and we should be logged in to Ubuntu. And now we can start to have some fun, but first there's a couple things we need to do in order to make our interaction less subtle with the computer. So normally the beauty of SSH is we're logged into kind of like a back door and the user has no idea what we're doing because there's no real opportunity for them to see any of this sort of stuff that we're doing. Even if we were going to launch a terminal, by default, it would be forwarding a graphical X window, meaning a Firefox window would pop up on our end rather than on theirs. Now, in order to change this, we need to modify a couple things in order to make sure that we're exporting all of the graphical stuff we're calling to the display rather than back to our SSH window. So first we're going to export display and then equals colon 0, 0.0. All right, now we should also be recording on our other uh, device. So let's go ahead and just launch something really simple and see if we can make it just pop up really fast. So if we type, uh, let's say X term, let's see if we can launch. There we go. All right, so even that is probably enough to spook someone, but let's go ahead and start taking it a little bit further with some audio effects and also some video effects. So, on our attacker computer, uh, let's go ahead and type sudo modprobe uh, pcspkr. And that is going to allow us to actually modify the speaker and start putting out some interesting sounds. So we can type in the password again. And now we have the ability to start, start making some beeping sounds and some other noises. Now, all right, one of the first things we can do is use the built-in speak to just say something that might alarm a user. Uh, let's say,
oops, type say, and then in quotes. You have been hacked. All right, so that's, that's already something that might cause someone to run into the room thinking someone else is there. But that voice isn't the only voice that the computer can do. If we want to change something, we can also try eSpeak. And try another string to see if it sounds more realistic. You have been hacked big time. Personally, I like eSpeak a little bit better than Say. It sounds a little bit less demonic. But in general, either of these are enough to make someone immediately think there's someone else in the room or not understand where that voice is coming from uh, in their computer box. So you can make it say all sorts of hilarious things, obviously, after you do the pseudo mob probe PC speaker command. But uh, keep in mind that there's even more stuff you can do. And making the computer talk isn't necessarily the most fun way to interact with your target. Now, people deal with technology making noises all the time, and if it's talking to them, it might occur to them that it's uh, somebody's messing with them. But if you start to introduce some nebulous beeping, then people usually have a harder time figuring it out. So we're going to introduce a program called Beep, and if it's not installed by default, you can type apt install beep, and it should oops, sudo apt install beep. And I like Beep a lot because it's capable of making all sorts of random annoying noises. Now, if you type man beep, which is a great command, then you can see that there's a general syntax for you can define the length of the beep, the frequency of the beep. There's so many different types of beeps you can generate. But in general, I like to combine these beeps with different things. So here, we let's just do a really simple example. Uh, let's see. Beep, tack C, tack F. So I'm going to Q out of this. All right, now we're going to go ahead and paste the beep command. And I'm just going to set the frequency to 400 megahertz, uh, the duration to uh, 50 milliseconds, I think, and then the length to 10 milliseconds. And let's see what that sounds like. Very subtle. Let's increase the length a little bit and maybe make it a little higher. See what that sounds like. Uh, and maybe increase the duration. Okay, so now we have a beep. Now, this beep can drive people crazy. We can really make them uh, think that something is very wrong with their computer, depending on the way that we use it. So if we want to do something like have a series of beeps, there's even different ways that we can, let's see if we can do a tack R2. Now we can start repeating the beep. So let's say, let's drop this down to a little bit lower of a noise and maybe make the repetition 10. Imagine if you're on your computer and it just started making this noise. it would be a little bit concerning, especially if you hadn't done anything to really warrant uh, getting warned by your computer that way. Well, imagine if it did it every 60 seconds. Well, one way that you can make a computer really start to exhibit signs of being seriously compromised is by installing a cron tab. So let's go to C-R-O-N-T-A-B and we'll type tack L and that'll list all the cron tabs that are currently there, if there are any, and you might see none here, but here you can see that I've created a malicious beep one that uh, is just commented out here. So to change that, we can type crontab tack E and then go down here and get rid of this uh, commented out section. So we'll go ahead and press control X and Y to save. And now we've installed a crontab, which every 60 seconds will start beeping uh, out of control. Uh, for 10, 10 different times at a frequency of 300.7, which is quite annoying and very concerning, uh, especially if you're just trying to go about your business and co your computer is persistently beeping at you. Now, we'll hear this in a second, but uh, what else can we do that's really going to be alarming to someone who doesn't know a lot about... Oh, oh, something, oh, something's gone horribly wrong. All right, 
Again, so not something that we want to hear. Let's go back and comment this out so we can continue with what we're doing without being disturbed. But you can see that every 60 seconds this is going off is going to be really annoying. And basically what we're saying here is that uh, this is checking for minutes, hours, days, and effectively we're saying wildcard. Every 60 seconds when you check this, uh, go ahead and run this command, which is very, very annoying. We can also expand on this with any of the techniques we're going to talk about, which will basically give us a platform to schedule things that can be really annoying and very flashy, like our next example, which will be to open a X term window as uh, maximized as it possibly can be, and then also do something that's going to look very suspicious. Let's do sudo X term, which will open up a sketchy looking terminal window. We'll type maxim tack maximize. We'll do tac e for execute, and we'll do sudo tcp dump. And what this is going to do is basically monitor the web traffic. But to somebody who doesn't understand technology, it's going to look like their system has been hacked big time. Let's try it. Fun. Oh, oh. So imagine if your computer was doing this suddenly and beeping furiously. You probably wouldn't like it, but we can make this even worse. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's uh, go ahead and cancel that. And then imagine that you're sitting at your computer and we want to make this happen 10 times. So basically, uh, we want to make it so the person is working on a normal program and all of a sudden these X terminal windows that are spewing a bunch of information about the internet just start popping up all over and messing with them. All right, well, let's go ahead and do that. So we'll do a bash uh, command that's just for I in and then within these brackets, we'll type I, or sorry, one dot dot, and then the number we want to go to, in this case, let's do 10. Uh, we'll say, we'll close this and type do, and we'll go ahead and do what we did before. We'll do a pseudo X term, maximize, all that fun stuff. And then at the end of this, we'll close it off with a semicolon and then type done. And if you don't type done, then it never knows when it's what's done and it's very annoying. So, all right, pretend you're a user, you're on your computer, and then let's see if this works. Oops. So I'll need to go back and put one last semicolon right here. And let's see if this works. All right, so the user tries to exit out. They're, they don't like this. It's spooky and they want it to go away. So they'll click out of the window. And there it is again. And again, and again, and again. There's really not much they can do. Uh, it's gonna go 10 times. You can make it 100 times. You can make this a bash uh, cron tab so that it just keeps happening every 60 seconds. It's very, very frustrating. And um, this can definitely start to get on someone's nerves, especially if when they're trying to do something and you start killing their processes. So if you want to kill processes, uh, let's say that we have somebody working on Firefox and they've opened up a window and they're trying to get something done. We can type top in order to get the process ID. And here we can see the process ID for Firefox is right there. I'll press Control C to stop it. And on the user side, they're kind of doing their thing and we can just type kill and then the process ID. And now they're not doing anything they were doing before. Annoying, very annoying. Uh, in fact, you can even do a cron tab that basically searches for a process that's running and kills it persistently. So they really can't do anything at all, which is very annoying. All right. so. I've created one script that I think is pretty funny, and we can do the Rick Swarm or the beeps. Let's do the Rick Swarm because everybody loves the Rick Swarm. So just so you can see, the beeps is effectively, well, okay, they're too good. We have to do them. Okay, so another thing we can do is put up alarming warnings that basically really scare the person into thinking they've done something wrong. In this case, we're going to use a uh, whip tail, which is a way that we can display warnings in the terminal and they really look quite serious when we do them in the right way. So first we're going to open an X terminal window. We're going to maximize and full screen it. We're going to use a large font size and then by executing whip tail, we're going to say 
uh, in the title that there's a critical warning, an action the user has done cannot be undone, and in the message box, we're gonna say something very scary. We also need to define exactly where this is within the terminal, and after a little bit of tweaking, we found that 2379 is usually the way when a terminal window opens up, it's the right way to orient it. So let's see if we can uh, make somebody feel <laughs> a little bit uncomfortable about uh, what they've done on the computer recently by sending them this helpful message. There we go. Now, of course, we can also con uh, combine this with beeps and all sorts of other things in order to make it really unpleasant and pretty obvious that that person has been hacked. All right, so let's go ahead and let them go. And you can imagine if you got 100 of these opening on your desktop window, along with a whole bunch of beeping and other nonsense, you would be pretty afraid and freaked out that somebody had definitely broken in. But let's top this off with the Rick Swarm. So the Rick Swarm will simply open up a bunch of Firefox windows, but we're gonna do it, uh, if you just do this by default, it will actually open up everything in a tab, which is not as fun. So for the coup de gras, we're going to take the Rick Swarm, which is for I in one to 10, do Firefox. We're gonna specify we wanna open in a new window, and then we're gonna go to, of course, the Rickroll video. So these don't auto start, but as soon as you click on the tab, they basically begin loading and playing. So let's send this video off by doing a good Rick Swarm. And we're not just gonna, we're not just gonna do 10. We're gonna put our production assistant, Nick, up against a hundred Rick Swarms. So let's see if he can punch these out at the end of the video. So here we go, 100, actually no, 200 Ricks are gonna spawn on this computer. And this might be the end of the video uh, in terms of being able to record, but let's go ahead and send 200 Ricks to this poor computer on the other end. And if there's any evidence your computer has been haunted, it's there's nothing like having a bunch of, um, of Ricks pop up. Now, once we get up to a certain number, Firefox might resist us and try to start uh, limiting the number of individual windows we can pop up. As you can see, we've now broken, uh, <laughs> we've broken the amount of bricks that we can pop up. So 200 might be a little ambitious. Let's go back down to 10 and see how those pan out without stressing this attack out too much. These are just a couple of different ways that you can use SSH to prove that you have remote access to a computer. Now this is of course useful for penetration testers who need to establish that as a matter of their job, and for people who have access to a computer in order to play a prank on someone, but keep in mind that doing this without permission is probably going to make people think that something really malicious is going on and could cause them to overreact. Now, while this is fun, make sure that you don't get caught doing this on a system that you don't have permission to access because it could result in legal fees, fines, and other sorts of nastiness, depending on where you do it and how seriously the person who owns a computer takes a sort of intrusion. That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. If you have any problems while you're doing this or setting it up, you can check out the Nullbyte article linked in the description. And if you have any ideas for future episodes, send me a message on Twitter at Cody Kinsey because I'd love to hear from you. We'll see you next time.